setting goals with God first. And I'm so glad you have joined us if you're watching my online. I hope you'll go ahead and take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, because this morning we're going to be looking at the greatest goal of all, love God first. The greatest goal of all, love God first. You see, when it comes to setting goals with God first, then the greatest goal of all should begin with the greatest commandment. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 40, the Bible says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Uh, Jesus has just answered a question from the Sadducees, and now the Pharisees come, and they ask him another question. And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the great and the first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The Bible says, going back to verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, you know, Jesus had three groups that were against him, and they were always uh, popping up in the Gospels. You had the Herodians, you had the Sadducees, you had the Pharisees, and they were always vying with each other for control and influence over the people and prominence with the populace and always favor with the Roman authorities that they might be able to extend their own authority under them. And so Jesus had just answered the question by the Sadducees, and he kind of put them in their place. For Matthew says that in verse 34, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. Do you, do you know what the word silence means? It means muzzle. It's as if he slapped a muzzle on a yipping, yapping dog, and it could not bark anymore. So complete and perfect was his answer for their question. Man, they had said they had gathered together. Now, you've got the Pharisees and the Sadducees gathering together. You know, there's an old Arab proverb, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. These two groups were never together except when it came to opposing Jesus. And one of them, a lawyer. Now, that is not uh, Esquire. That is not a lawyer in the way that we would think of the word lawyer today. That, that is more like a theologian. Uh, that is a, a uh, religious leader and teacher, someone that uh, was looked up with respect. And, and so this lawyer, this theologian, asked him a question. Now, did he ask Jesus a question because he honestly wanted to know the answer? Uh, no, that's not what the Bible says, is it? It says he wanted to ask Jesus this question to test him. See, the Sadducees had already been shot down in flames, so I'm sure the Pharisee now thought, hey, I'm smarter than those guys. I I've got the question. And he asked him this question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? What is the greatest commandment? They were trying to hang Jesus on the horns of a dilemma. Uh, you see, if he began to pick one commandment over the other, then he was immediately initiating debate, and they thought that they could diminish his influence in the people because, after all, if all the commandments come from God and God is great, then all the commandments are great. You can't pick one over the other. Now, Jesus gives his answer, and he's very quick, very immediate, very specific and he says, there is a great commandment, one greater than all the others. And this great commandment, I would say to you, needs to be yours and my greatest goal. And so we come to the first part of our study. The greatest commandment or the greatest goal, if it's to love God first, then shouldn't the greatest goal be to, to being to love God first? Uh, isn't that the greatest goal? That's what Jesus said. Not just a religion, but loving God is a relationship. Now, Christianity is, of course, a religion. 
The Bible says, pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to care for the orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James 1.27. It is okay to refer to and perfectly acceptable and right to talk about Christianity as a religion. But it is a religion based on a relationship. It is religion based on the grace of God that because of what He has done for us, we are received by Him. The Bible says, to as many as received Him, to them gave He the right, the legal standing, to be called the children of God. You see, God made you for relationship, uh, not simply for a religion that, that is empty or, or man-enforced that has no vitality, no vibrancy, no victory. He made you for a relationship with Him. This past week, GOP presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy said that we've lost seemingly an entire generation of young people who are willing and ready and eager to march and protest to so many causes, causes such as transgenderism and climatism and socialism and progressivism and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And he said because they have a God-shaped void and they're looking to fill it with all of the wrong things. Now, Vivek says a lot of things that I like and agree with, but he's not a Christian. Report is he is a Hindu, and yet he understands that the problem that we're seeing in this culture, in Western civilization, literally around the world, is that people are striving to fill a void in their heart and soul that is there because God made them in His image, and until we are connected with our Creator by being saved and forgiven, we will always have that emptiness. No matter how sincere, no matter how uh, determined, no matter how uh, outspoken you might be, there's nothing you can do that will last in filling up what God has already built within you, and that is the capacity to know the God who created you, who loves you, who knows you better than anyone else and loves you still better than you could ever imagine. The greatest crisis of our nation today is a spiritual crisis. And this crisis can only be found in a true, genuine, qualified, trustworthy Savior. This is what the gospel is about. This is what we've been singing about. Uh, this is why we gather here. This, this is what we are to be about as a people who choose to worship as a Southern Baptist church. Taking the gospel to the world. That is what God has called us to do. That is what God has empowered us to do through the person of the Holy Spirit and through His living Word. I'm so thankful this year that as of today, it looks like in 2023, God used this church family, get this, to give a total to the Lottie Moon International Mission Christmas Offering of $232,943. Can I have an amen? That is remarkable. We didn't even set a goal. We may never set another goal again to see that kind of response from God's people. God bless you if you had a part in this offering. You see, having a relationship with God is about something that is dynamic, that is um, um, vibrant, that is on mission. Uh, notice what Jesus said in our text. Jesus made it very clear. You shall love the Lord your God. Let's say that, that together, church. You shall love the Lord your God. Now, let's break that down for just a minute. You choose, as I choose, whether or not to love God. We choose. It's a choice. Love is more than simply an ooey-gooey, warm, fuzzy feeling. It is a choice. Do you always have warm, fuzzy feelings about your teenage kids? 
No, you choose to love them anyway. Students, do you always have a warm, fuzzing feeling about mom and dad? No, you choose to love them anyway. Love is a choice. For God so loved the world that he sent his son, meaning he chose to send his son for you and me. That we, you shall love who? The Lord. Yahweh, Jehovah, El Shaddai, Adonai, the God of the universe, the God of heaven and earth, the Lord God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, God who is one in unity, God the Trinity. You see, this is who we are to love. Uh, it's not, God is not some ambiguous force be with you sort of Star Wars kind of thing. God is personal. God is real. God is all-powerful. God is wonderful. God is awesome. And God wants to be your Lord in the decisions you make even as He is Lord of heaven and earth. Are you allowing Him, submitting to Him, surrendering Him to be Lord of your life? And then love the Lord your God. Is He yours? Have you come to a place where you have said, Lord Jesus, I believe and I confess that I'm a sinner, that I cannot save myself, that I do not deserve heaven but only hell. Nevertheless, I believe you love me. I believe you died to save me. I believe you rose from the dead, and I believe you will forgive me of my sins and give me everlasting life if I ask you to do it. And right now, Lord Jesus, I am asking you to forgive me. I believe in you to save me. Come into my heart and give me a home with you in heaven, and until then, a purpose with you here on earth. And help me to live this day forward by your grace and always for your glory. Have you prayed that prayer? Then he is your God. Have you prayed that prayer? Then keep serving him as your Lord. If you've been saved, how are you doing with loving God these days? If we're not careful, and I'm putting myself in the same boat, please hear me. As your pastor and friend, I'm not standing up here thumping my chest and saying I am the one who always has this right all the time. I break this commandment far more times, I'm sure, than even I realize. But even though I am weak, He is strong. God's grace is consistent. And where sin does abound, His grace does much more so abound. And understanding that, I want to all the more love Him more. Not simply for what he's done, but also wonderfully for who he is. And I think you, if you're a Christian, want to do the same thing. And so that brings us with the challenge of loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, as we'll look at next. How do we do that? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, how do we grow in our faith? How do we feed our faith? For that is the way that we continue to come before God and discover Him and learn of Him and follow Him. Well, we grow in our faith by growing in our time in this book, in the Bible, in God's Word. For the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I'm so thankful that our Vacation Bible School theme verse this year that we'll be doing is Romans 12:2. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But if we go day after day, week after week, month after month, and the only time we ever hear or bother to read what God says is at church, then we are probably not loving Him as we could or as we should. What about the next part of our story? Love is more than a noun, it's a verb. This is clear in Scripture. It's not just about loving like Jesus, it is living like Jesus. The heart of the matter is loving God with all of your heart because whenever or whatever we allow to capture our heart, it also captures our will 
and it captures our mind. And whatever captures our will and captures our mind, captures our desire, that will cause us to live according to what we have chosen to love. Because what we think about the most, what we desire for the most, what we envision the most, what we dream about the most is that which we love the most. You see, to love God fully means that we are totally committed in our lives to Him. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that we are sinless, but it does mean we are totally committed to Him. And yet, what is it that Satan tells us? He tells us that loving God won't really be worth it. And so people find themselves chasing after sinful desires, deceived into thinking that somehow if I love God, I'm going to come up short. It's not going to be quite everything that Brian says it is or that another preacher says it is or or that I've heard it to be. You see, When we chase after sinful desires, the Bible says we do so because, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, they exchange the truth about God for a lie. And so today in our society and culture, there is this new mantra, is the love only gospel. Look at love with love is the bumper sticker of the day. The implication is clear. Love never disagrees with what anyone else affirms or asserts or claims for themselves. Uh, After all, the the only sin is not what you choose to love or how you choose to love or how do you choose to express your love, but, but telling someone else that they shouldn't do that. Why, you're not affirming that person in their choice and in their own truth. That's not loving. And should you fail to submit to this demand today in our society, then expect to be attacked and criticized, despised, and to whatever degree they can, canceled. And a lot of Christians are afraid to speak up. But when you love someone, don't you speak up for them? Uh, When you love doing life with them and following them in life, don't you enjoy talking about them? Sure you do. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Matthew 6.33 is the reason why Patrick has changed the time for our Tuesday night young adult uh, college and young professional ministry called Kainos to 6.33 as a reminder even in the time that that service begins that, hey, we are here to seek His kingdom first in our lives. What is it that the new thing that God does in us when we are saved and makes us new creations in Him? It is that we now have a new purpose, and that purpose is to seek first His kingdom in the goal of loving Him first and foremost. Loving God first is an action verb. The more you seek to love God, then the more you're going to delight in Him. Are you delighting in God? Are you seeking Him? Jesus said, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Now, he's quoting from Deuteronomy 6. I believe it's 6.5. It is the Shema. It is the foundational prayer of Judaism. It is that first verse of Scripture that every Jewish child memorizes. It is the beginning, the Shema, the prayer that you begin your day and you end your day by praying that, that the Lord God is one, and it talks about that we should love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. It is still the way that many, if not most, Jewish services begin by by praying or reciting the Shema. And that's what Jesus is doing. Talks about our heart. That's not the muscle. That's the essence, the being of who we are. With all of your soul, that's your physical strength. You have to be engaged and involved. It's an action word. And then with your mind. Have you been blessed and encouraged by a Christian who is sharp of mind and they show you things and like to talk about things from God's Word that were there, but maybe you didn't see it. And in seeing it and in hearing it, you yourself are challenged to be a more faithful follower of Jesus. I hope I'm that way for some of you. 
I know some of you are certainly that way for me. Well, then we come to the last part of our study. The Bible says they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. That is what Satan wants to do. He wants to convince us that loving God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength is somehow going to be a disappointment. It's not, number three, not a check mark, but a life change. We're not talking about some task list this morning. Here's the point. The goal of loving God isn't about simply checking something off like the old-fashioned offering envelopes that as kids we used to fill out and turn in in Sunday school. Uh, It's talking about a life change that never ends. Uh, The name Christian should denote a life change that is unique and cannot be copied by anything and anyone else in the world because it is a life change empowered by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, caused by the amazing, all-sufficient grace of an almighty God. Jesus underscored that when he said those who seek to love him most in Luke chapter 7, verse 47, are those who understand how much they have been forgiven. You want to feed your faith when it comes to loving your Savior. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you once again just how great a sinner you are and how wonderful and great God's salvation and forgiveness has been in your life thus far. In Revelation, Jesus commends his church at Ephesus for all the good things that they had done, and yet what does he say? There is still one thing I have against you. You have left your first love. They had it, but they lost it, just like some of us. There was a day when there was no competition seemingly with our love for Jesus Christ our excitement of reading His Word, our thrill of knowing Him in prayer, the joy of telling others about Him, of singing His praises, or times when you had your moments of devotion that were so real and so heavy with the presence and the awareness of God that you felt that if you turned your head fast enough, you just might see His shadow. And yet, No more are things like that. You've lost it. Our love for God is never to be based upon our own commitment, our own self-determination, our our own uh, reputation. It is to be based upon the simple fact that God has loved you first. God has loved you first. Not only best, but first. For the Bible says God has demonstrated His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world, including you and me, that He gave His only begotten Son for us. Life change, as we've heard before, is based upon what Jesus is saying here, two simple commandments. We already talked about loving God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. But then he talks about loving others as yourself, and that's from Leviticus 19. You see, the way that we reveal, the way that we show, the way that we display to others of the difference that the grace of God has made in our life, of knowing that we now have a personal relationship with the God of the universe who loves us and died for us and rose from the dead to show us that the same power of the victory that conquered death in the grave is the same power by which we can live as the children of God today. And we are to let that out in our devotion to Him, in the way we spend our money, in the way we spend our time, uh, by our desire to please Him. Do you desire to please God first and foremost? Do you, uh, do you begin by taking God's Word and believing it? Does this have authority in your life? Is this just another old book that you don't have time for because of all the other social media 
allowances that you schedule into your daily routine? Are you in a place where you enjoy talking to Him? What about talking about Him? What about focusing on Him, the author and completer, the perfecter of your faith? On another occasion, Jesus, in John chapter 5, beginning of verse 42, He's talking to what might be the same group of Pharisees, or certainly some of the same ones in Matthew chapter 22, and He says, I know that you do not have the love of God in your heart. Remember, he could see the heart, just like he can see your heart and mine today. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. How did he know that they did not have the love of God in their hearts? Because they had not accepted the Son of God in their hearts. What's the next verse of John 3 after verse 16? God did not send His Son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. God is not after you to cause you harm. God is after you to save you. And when you have been saved then life change makes sense, for now your life for the rest of your days is about loving God, and because you love Him, for He has first loved you, now by Him you love others in His name. Let's be that kind of a church this year in 2024.